Привет! И спасибо за приглашение моего доклад прямо к Марс. My talk is Mars Direct, Humans to the Red Planet Within a Decade. Now, how can that be? Many people have the preconception that human missions to Mars is something for the future, for the next generation or one beyond. Perhaps it is because they have seen concepts like this as the basis for such a mission. This is actually a NASA concept for a Mars spaceship. It looks like an Imperial Star Destroyer. Um, it, uh, giant nuclear electric engines, ion drive. You can see it's quite large. Mars is there for scale. And, uh, but this is not a, a design for a Mars mission. This is an attempt to realize the science fiction vision of the interplanetary spaceship. But what a Mars mission is about is not realizing giant spaceships. It's about sending packages. Sending a package from the surface of the Earth to the surface of Mars, capable of supporting a small group of people, and sending either that or a comparable payload back. So what do we need to do that? Not this. We need this. Okay. Back to the future. Um, you're looking at 1972. Saturn V taking off. This is a heavy lift booster. There are no such boosters in the world today. Elon Musk is working on one. Whether he makes one or not, we can make them. We made them a generation ago. They can be made again. 140 tons to low Earth orbit in one launch. Okay. Now, if we had such a system, which is hardly futuristic, how could we do a Mars mission? Well, here we go. Um, this is the mission plan of Mars Direct. You can launch to Mars every 26 months, roughly every two years. So here's how it goes. In the first year of the plan, we launch one of these boosters off the Cape, and we use its upper stage to throw to Mars a payload of about 40 tons. If you can lift 140 tons to orbit, you can shoot 40 of that off to Mars. And this is an unmanned payload, unwomaned too, there's no one in it at all. It flies out to Mars, takes eight months to get there on a minimum energy trajectory, and then it uses an aero brake to capture into Mars orbit, and then after we check it out and check out the weather, we then bring it more deeply into the atmosphere, use the aero brake to slow us down all the way to subsonic speeds, pop a parachute, come down slow, and put ourselves down softly on Mars with rockets just like we did with Viking in 1976, or in a somewhat different way with Curiosity in 2012. Now, what is this payload that we have landed on Mars? Okay. It consists of a number of things. The primary object is an Earth return vehicle, which is a little rocket ship for coming back from Mars to Earth. It has a cabin, which is uh, five meters in diameter with tight quarters for a crew of four to take a six-month voyage from Mars to Earth. But no one's in it now. Then there are two methane oxygen chemical propulsion stages, which, however, are unfueled. They can't be fueled. If they were, this would be much too heavy for a, a heavy lift booster to shoot off to Mars. But, however, in some of the lower stage tanks, we have six tons of hydrogen. And then below the vehicle, not shown in this diagram, we have a little truck, like a little pickup truck that runs on a methane oxygen engine. Okay, and in the back of that truck, we have a little nuclear reactor with a power of 100 kilowatts. Now, 100 kilowatts is about the same amount of power as drives a large car. So we're not talking about a giant nuclear power plant that powers a city. We're just talking about a nice little nuke tucked in the back of a truck. And then we drive the truck a few hundred meters away, we put the reactor on the ground, preferably in a crater, to provide shielding, and then we turn it on, and what we do then is, what we do is some basic chemistry, 
in which we act the hydrogen from Mars with, excuse me, the hydrogen that we brought to Mars with some carbon dioxide, which is what the Martian atmosphere is made of. They turn into methane and water. We electrolyze the water to make oxygen, recycle the hydrogen, and before you know it, we've turned the six tons of hydrogen from Earth into 108 tons of methane oxygen on the surface of Mars. Okay, so now we have a fully fueled Earth return vehicle sitting on the surface of Mars. Thank you. Okay, uh, and for those interested, there's the chemistry. By the way, if you want to know more about this, my book, The Case for Mars, is out in English, and it's going to be out in Russian this summer, published by Exmo. Don't miss it. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, the, uh, okay, so the Earth return vehicle is now fueled. So at the next launch window, two years later, we shoot two more rockets off to Mars. The first shoots out another one of these Earth return vehicle ve uh, systems. The other shoots out a habitat with a crew of four astronauts in it. Now, because our return ride is waiting for us on the surface of Mars, we don't need to fly to Mars in a gigantic Imperial Star Destroyer. We don't even need to fly to Mars in a comparatively modest Millennium Falcon. No, we can fly to Mars in a tuna can. And this is very fortunate because we know how to build tuna cans, although this one is somewhat bigger than the one you find at the supermarket. It is about eight meters in diameter and five meters tall. So it's got two decks, each with two and a half meters of headspace. The upper deck is where the people live. The lower deck is more of a cargo hold workshop kind of place. Here is one potential layout of the upper deck. You see there's a little stateroom for each of the four astronauts, a science lab, a galley, exercise area, and in the center is the solar flare storm shelter. Now, this is worth talking about for a second. There's two kinds of radiation that can get you in interplanetary space. Solar flares, cosmic rays. They're different. Solar flares come from the sun. A big pulse of radiation, only maybe one big one a year. But in the course of that, it could deliver maybe 10 sieverts of radiation enough to kill an unshielded astronaut. That would be bad. However, the kind of radiation that solar flares are made of are protons with energies of about a million volts, which can be stopped by 12 centimeters of water, or things that from the nuclear point of view are essentially the same thing as water, such as food, or things that water and food become as the mission uh, proceeds. Um, and we have enough of that on board the ship to shield a central area so that if a solar flare happens, you go in there until the all clear rings, you come out, you're safe. Now the other kind of radiation are cosmic rays. They don't come from the sun, they come from interstellar space. And they have energies, not of millions of volts, but thousands of times that, billions of volts. They would go right through 12 centimeters of water. It would take meters of water to stop them. We can't do that. So you're gonna take the dose. You're going to take about half a sievert worth of cosmic rays. But that only represents about a 1% risk of getting cancer at some point later in your life. Um, and in fact, um, there have been about uh, 10 astronauts and cosmonauts who, staying on the International Space Station or the Mir or the Salyut stations, over long durations have actually gotten that kind of dose uh, in, some in, in larger uh, cases um, than they would have gotten going to Mars and back. And we see no radiological casualties among that group at all. Okay? Um, these are people we know. Um, and, uh, but you wouldn't expect that. A half a percent of risk, um, you know, over 10 people, chances are no one would have uh, encountered uh, a fatality. Uh, and uh, if you compare that to smoking, which for an average American smoker is about a 20% risk of cancer, um, they're much better off. So in fact, uh, if you chose the Martian crew out of smokers and you sent them to Mars without their tobacco, you would be reducing their chance of getting cancer. So. 
So one reason to send people to Mars might be for their health. Now, the uh, another, uh, but there is a phenomenon in space which has caused major health effects, and that is zero gravity, which causes the loss of bone and muscle. Um, now, this is not fatal. Uh, it will take us six months to get to Mars. That's how long we go on a space station in an average tour. But we don't want the astronauts to get to Mars weak because they have to do field exploration. Hiking around in a spacesuit is like heavy duty backpacking. The people have to be in shape to do it. They're going to explore. We want them in shape. So we can create artificial gravity by uh, tethering the spacecraft off of the upper stage of the booster that threw them to Mars. That stage is also traveling to Mars and it can be used as a counterweight on the end of a tether. The tether is about 1,500 uh, meters long. You spin this up at one revolution per minute, it will make Mars gravity in the hab. If you spin it up at a little less than two revolutions per minute, it will create Earth gravity in the hab, and thus there will be no such zero gravity health effects. All right, so it takes six months to fly to Mars. And by the way, you want to go to Mars in six months because if you don't stop at Mars, if you're on the six-month trajectory, you will loop around and you will into about twice Earth's distance from the sun and get right back to Earth's distance exactly two years after you left. So the Earth will be there. That's called a free return. That's a good safety feature. If you try to go to Mars faster, you loop out further and then you come back. It'll take you longer to get back. There won't be enough, uh, uh, the Earth won't be there. But we get close to Mars, we fire a pyrotechnic, it cuts the cable, we aerobrake into Mars orbit, and then we go and land at landing site number one, where the fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for us. We should be able to land right there. We've explored the place with robots, we have radar beacons on the ground, we got an ace flying, the hab, go right there. But if we're off by hundreds of kilometers, we're still okay, because we have a pressurized ground rover in the hab, that has a one-way range of 1,000 kilometers. So it would really take really, really bad piloting to land outside of that radius of action. Now, however, if even that happens, if we land over there, excuse me, um, you know, wrong side of the planet, which would represent a real problem with the pilot selection process at NASA. Um, if, if that were to happen, we can send the second Earth return vehicle to land near them, and, and that would be our way home. And finally, if none of that works, we can just tough it out on the surface of Mars until more supplies in another Earth return vehicle can be sent out to us uh, two years later. So we have a four-layer defense in depth on the mission, as well as one abort option. Okay. Now, so, we're on Mars. Uh, well, actually... Let me talk one more second here. So the second Earth return vehicle, though, is not really for us. It lands somewhere else where it starts making propellant for the next human mission, which will fly to it two years later, along with another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, but which otherwise opens up landing site number three. So the plan is every two years, two boosters launched, one to open up a new site, one to exploit the previous site. Two boosters every two years is an average of one per year. This is something that any nation doing it could certainly afford to do. Now, this is an actual photograph of the Mars base. Okay, so the, here is the Earth return vehicle, the conical vehicle. There is the reactor and the crater in the background, the tuna can hab where the astronauts live and work. Uh, the uh, exploration rover, some solar panels to uh, use as backup power for the reactor, also the engine of the car can be used as backup power, and a greenhouse, which is an experimental system to learn how to grow crops on Mars in Martian soil, Martian gravity, Martian water, Martian sunlight for the benefit of future missions and future bases. Now, we are going to be on Mars for a year and a half before the planets line up to shoot us back on another six-month voyage home. What are we going to do on Mars in a year and a half? We're going to explore. This actually is a photograph of Mars. 
uh, taken by the Viking Orbiter in 1976. And what you see here are dry riverbeds on Mars, massive numbers of them. Okay, there are no canals on Mars, it's a myth, but there certainly are dry riverbeds, dry oceans, dry lakes, dry ponds. Okay, and Mars had liquid water on it for a billion years, five times as long as it took life to appear on Earth after there was liquid water here. So, if the theory, which by the way was originated by a Russian scientist, Oparin, um, that life originates from chemistry through a process of complexification of simple chemicals forming more complex, complex chemicals and still more complex until eventually self-reproducing complex systems emerge. If this theory is correct, then life should have appeared on Mars. And if we go to Mars and start doing some serious fossil hunting, we should be able to find some of these uh, fossilized life forms on the surface. And in fact, if we go to Mars and set up drilling rigs and get down to the Martian groundwater, because there is liquid water underground on Mars, which is an environment in which microbial life can survive, we reach that groundwater, we might find survivors of ancient Martian life living there, just as there are survivors of the most ancient life on Earth living in groundwater on Earth. Okay, who can no longer survive the surface because of oxygen. Uh, you know, we and our friends, the plants, have polluted the Earth's atmosphere with oxygen. Um, so, but they're still there, they might still be there. We could find them, and if we find them, we'll have proven not just that there's life on Mars, but that life is a general phenomenon in the universe, because there's thousands of planets, we know that now, and they all have, um, every star has a good distance where you have a habitable zone around it. If life originates everywhere, or if it, life is a high probability event, it's everywhere. And since the history of life on Earth is one of development from simple forms to more complex forms, manifesting greater capacities for activity, intelligence, and ever more rapid evolution, if life can evolve in this way, it means we're not alone. This is something that thinking men and women have wondered about for thousands of years. So, at the end of the mission, we go home. We leave the base behind on Mars. As this uh, plan proceeds, we have a string of exploration uh, uh, bases. But eventually, we'll know the answer to whether there is life on Mars, and the real question is gonna be, will there be life on Mars? Mars has the elements needed for life, it means it has the elements needed for civilization. So if we build a base on Mars and start mastering the technologies needed to turn Martian materials into resources, if we learn how to not just make fuel and oxygen on Mars, but to grow plants on Mars, to make ceramics, glasses, uh, metals, plastics, wires, tubes, habitation structures, then Mars becomes a place where human beings can live and where eventually new branches of human civilization can develop. Okay, at the first of many, okay, because Mars is not the final destination, Mars is just the direction. And if we do what we can do in our time, which is establish this first human foothold on Mars, then 500 years from now, there will be new branches of civilization, not just on Mars, but on thousands of planets orbiting stars in this reach of the galaxy. And when they look back at this time, what will they care about? Okay, will they care about who won the various power struggles in various little places? No, but what we did to make their civilization possible is what will matter. This time will be remembered because this is when we first set sail for other worlds. И може бит, ми можем делат ета в мястя. На Марс!